Dan, um, there was really important um, uh, presentation uh, by Andrew Way at the late breaking abstract session um, in something that may actually change the, the standard of care in AML, and that was with um, oral azacitidine, as I'm calling it. Can you tell us more about the Quasar study? Yeah, and yeah, you know, I, I, I fear a lot of people who even attended ASH weren't able to make it because it was on, on Tuesday morning, but uh, really fascinating data, long awaited. It is oral azacitidine. It's the same molecule as the, as the conventionally de delivered azacitidine, albeit different pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties. Um, but the setting was patients who achieved a remission after intensive induction chemotherapy, plus minus some consolidation. And um, uh, those patients, once in a remission, were either given placebo or uh, this oral azacitidine compound for, uh, I believe, 14 days uh, of a 28-day of a cycle. And um, with that, the primary endpoint was survival. And they, they hit their primary endpoint with a hazard ratio of 0.69, I think, uh, that was highly statistically significant. So I think the implications here are clear, but, but I also think they're not as broad as a lot of people are going to assume they are. The implications are uh, exactly what the study showed, that in this setting, th for this population, this therapy can prolong survival. But we have to ask a couple questions. A, who are these patients? This study has been going on a long time, and practice patterns, I think, have probably changed. And in our uh, experience, most people, I would say the vast majority of people who are fit for intensive chemo chemotherapy, intensive induction, they get a remission, they're going on to a transplant. And that wasn't, these patients either were listed as ineligible or had a variety of reasons why they did. So, so I, I question, you know, if this were to be approved right now, you know, how would we actually use it? There's certainly no data, I, I think, to suggest that this could replace a transplant. Certain, maybe someday that is a, you know, a something that could be shown, but at the moment, I would, I would really struggle with that. So what I think this shows is that a maintenance therapy has viability and maintenance is a new paradigm in our disease. The, applica the direct applicability of this uh, study to our patients in our treatment landscape right now little bit questionable to me. Yeah, I mean, the study actually had a pretty long follow-up of close to four years. Mm -hmm. And although we um, increased the duration of that first remission by the oral azacitidine, when you go out to four or five years on those Kaplan-Meier curves, those curves are coming together. We are not curing patients. Sure. And so we should still be considering older patients for curative options. But at least in my practice, there are many, many patients who will never be eligible for transplant. And I do think that this is going to be a benefit for but them. But will it fit in the context of some of the new regimens that you're using now, which was not really, you know, tough to address in this? You know, I, I guess what I would say about um, this study is that if it leads to FDA approval of this agent, I think we have a lot of work to do with this agent in all of those contexts. But it would be a great thing if that happened. Uh, it, to me, I took away that you've got an active oral hypomethylating agent. Great. Uh, I don't know that this is the way I want to use it, but um, I'll, See, I, I'll I'm always not, take so, an extra. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, so this is, this is my concern. You know, I mean, I think the, the epigenetic properties of conventionally dosed azacitidine backing up, if that's even how this works. I mean, then we talk about this a lot for decades, but I think there's still reasonable question there. But the epigenetic properties of the way it's delivered may not be, um, you know, uh, um, identical to this delivery system with different PK and PD data. It, it, so I'm, I'm concerned that it, it's not it's, it's not going to behave. I, I, it clearly allowed for a survival benefit in this setting, full stop, and that's great. But did it do that through epigenetic properties or you know, is it going to phenocopy azacitidine uh, and can we just slot it in in all the places we're using azacitidine? I would love if that were the case. Patients would love if that were the case. But I think we got to see that on every individual situation. Yeah, and, and actually, I would say that there's a good chance that's not the case because we have to look at the history of this drug. And, and Rami knows this, and Guillermo from our group has done a lot of work in MDS frontline where the drug did not produce the same activity as IV azacitidine. So if we actually look at the history, this drug, I think conceptually this is great because it brings maintenance, a whole field of therapy into AML. So that's good. In this population, these were 55 plus patients and they could not go to transplant. Uh, but I think the big question here is, did it actually work well as a maintenance because it delivered a low continuous dose of therapy, patients were tolerating it, they were better, 
And if you move it front line, I think you really have to do that trial. And in the community, I think that's the message we want to give is do not, until we have some data, give oral of with venetoclaxate may be subtherapeutic. You know, the other thing I think is how are we going to get these patients? And to be careful where I say I'm on the steering committee so we know some, some of the data. It took a long time. The study took a long time, you know, 200 sites, 440 patients, still four years. And the problem is these are people who were 55 and above. And at the time of starting therapy, they were uh, eligible for induction. So they had to be eligible, but then later become ineligible. So something happened during that chemotherapy that made them ineligible, which is, it may happen, but I don't see it happen often, right? If you're ineligible to begin with, you're okay. But you're eligible, and then, okay, you got chemo, and then two months later, transplanter said, you know, I said yes, but no. So this is a very yeah. select but, but subset. Right. Yeah. But, but there is no doubt, I think, that the compound has activity. Of because course. Like, I think yeah. the, the, the struggle in MDS developing it was a little bit also the toxicity and the GI side effects and the optimal dosing. Uh, I think, you know, as mentioned, I, I will try to take this in a positive way that we have <coughs> positive study in maintenance that shows for the first time that maintenance could be valuable. As Harry mentioned, there are some patients as of today will benefit. As we evolve our treatment, this could be meaningless, like patients will be getting non-intensive chemo op options. But I think it's a, it's a positive study. I think it's-, it's yeah, You know, and, and I, I do want to come back to something. It's not just patients going through induction and consolidation becoming <coughs> unfit for transplant. There are so many reasons why patients do not go to transplant. They don't have a caregiver. They don't have this, they don't live close enough to a transplant center. They're over 70 and they don't want quote unquote curative therapies. One of the things to consider, which you're talking about new data now, um, Chris Hurrigan uh, presented data at EHA from the B, uh, uh, BMT CTN study, where they looked at um, the effect of MRD on outcomes with transplant. And this was a study that randomized patients between a reduced intensity and, and a myeloablative transplant. And what he showed was if the patient was, uh, had persistent disease by their MRD assay, that the, and the patient got a reduced intensity transplant, they had very poor outcomes. But if they got a myeloablative transplant, they did better. So as you're talking about older patients who will not be eligible for myeloablative transplants, will the transplant center say, no, I don't want to transplant that patient? And what Andrew Way showed in the presentation was there was a benefit even in the patient with MRD positive disease. So, so I, I agree with Rami, and I think we're all saying the same right. thing, that this is, this is a, an advance for our patients with AML, and exactly the patient that's going to receive it and benefit from it remains to be seen as things yeah. change. I, I think the only caution, I totally agree, is positive. We don't want people to not transplant patients, right. use this as a, because that, I think that's the spectrum, right? If that's you have exactly that patient, right. use it, but don't say, oh, now we have right. the drug. And, 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 and no, yeah. not to refer them to the exciting new treatments for patients above age of 60 that we have, because we have yes. several clinical right. trials. So, and, and the concern right. was so that this balance. trial was gonna yeah. blow up everybody's trial because it was gonna be paradigm shifting. I think we really need to sit back and learn how to use potentially a new tool, but that's what it is.